Another good day? It was a good day today. Nice. And just so we notice, we're using a lovely blended whiskey from Collingwood. Toasted maple wood from Collingwood, Ontario, so that we can drink, shop, and drink local. I can taste the toasted in it already. It's delicious. <laughs> You gotta get like a little thing so this doesn't keep tipping all the time. Hey, you know what I was thinking about recently was um, like going back seven years, the first time I went to court, how weird it was as a person, like, because <clears throat> most people, I think most people, never go to court at all. And when I first walked in, I was like kind of shaking and like my hands were sweating and I was just like really nervous. and. Um, there's like all these guards around and then the judge is on this big pedestal and stuff and he's got this big crest over his head and I felt like I'm in a place where I could go to jail and it was just like and I wasn't even a part of the trial I was just like trying to observe and stuff and uh, it took a few times like I, I intentionally went out to courts to try and get familiar more comfortable listen to the language get a sense of like there's all these traditions and stuff yeah. but um, so I always think, I still think about that actually when we're working with people and they're coming in and they're like in a state of shock and stuff and they're trying to understand everything and, and especially like, you know, and they're trying to say, well, what's going to happen when I go to court? And just explaining those simple things about like to help them get over all of that anticipation. It's a mystery to some people. And, you know, we spoke about this, about how to engage the public with what's going on in the criminal justice system pre this pandemic when we'd have to do a trial in person, we would have our client go to court with one of our uh, lawyers or one of our clerks to just watch trials, so to demystify the process because people just don't go to court. Well, and you don't have that experience. You don't know what it's like. Well, one of the things I remember too was just like kind of being stunned at you know the, the defense lawyers and the prosecutors and you know, the court clerks and everybody, you all know each other and stuff. It's almost like it's the second home or something. And you're so comfortable there. It stands out. And I'm just like, how can you ever get used to this? But you had to, of course, because like there was a time where you were just starting out. Do you, do you even remember your first uh, cases? Yeah. So I know I look very young, um, but uh, I have been doing this for over 28 years. So when I started out, I had gray hair. So they treated me like I was a senior lawyer, but... Yeah, like when you went, I was lucky because when I went to law school, I got into a program that allowed me to spend six months with a high profile lawyer and go to court and experience the process and meet the people. And so the, it became much more familiar. But when you go on your own as a lawyer doing your first few cases, it's, um, it can be a bit daunting because you're walking into a forum where you're trying to assert yourself and you have to develop your lawyer personality, if I can explain it that way. And it's, it's a bit daunting at the beginning. And when I came into the business in uh, 1993, it was at the tail end of an era where um, judges and crown attorneys were a bit, you know, were a bit different. Um, you know, everybody's very welcoming to some extent, but, you know, we had judges who would yell and people would be, quite, you know, assertive and, and it was not necessarily the most friendly environment and certainly not the most politically correct environment. Um, but it was like, Sounds it was, like it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, it was after, it was just after, you know, what the process was to get your, what we call disclosure in the business. So like the evidence from the crown and, you know, it was a whole different process where you'd set your dates for trial. You hope to God you get your disclosure in between and you try and prepare in a different manner. It was just completely different. So for a while, you really got to try and figure out how to get your legs, like how you stand on your own, how you develop the personality, how you assert yourself in court, and you develop your own style, and uh, each of us does it differently. Like in this firm, we're all different. But it was a different time. Like I think now, for a young lawyer coming into the business and going into court, um, they would experience very similar things, but it's much more forgiving now. Yeah. A friend of mine, he had a really amusing story because it was actually the more you get involved, the more lawyers you know, the more you realize how funny everybody is. But um, he Particularly had, me. <laughs> yeah. you. I actually, I was having lunch with a, a couple of lawyers and one of them <laughs> was like going, every lawyer I meet is so really, you know, hilariously funny, except for you. And everybody lost it. <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, so no, he was, uh, you know, so they had this, they have this thing called in camera, which is the opposite of what you think. Everybody has to leave the room unless yeah. you're directly involved. And uh, so they were doing an in-camera hearing. He was a lawyer, and, and they're just like, you have to leave, you have to leave. And he's just like, what? And they're just like, yeah, it's in-camera, you have to leave. And then he goes, I've been thrown out of better bars than this. And the judge just goes, oh I bet you have. You know <laughs> what, that, like... that's so funny. You know, over the last couple of years, we've lost some of the real personalities in criminal law. And, um, you know, there were a few lawyers when, when I was growing up in, in the business, and... They would say stuff in court like you wouldn't imagine to say now and stuff like that. And it, w it was a totally different era than it is now. And they'd say things and it would be funny and it would be off the cuff. And it was just, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, cowboyish at that time. Um, it's different now. It's definitely well, what's different. What's it like to get yelled at by a judge? Because that hasn't happened to me yet. Well, the first time it happens, yeah. it's uh, it can be terrifying. Um, and then... Uh, but, you know, you remember that you have a job to do and you have a human life to take care of. And so you're going to respond. But like every business um, and every career or whether you're a musician or you're an artist, it takes time to perfect your craft. And so over time, you start to become much more comfortable with yourself, your style and your knowledge. And then you assert yourself much differently. So at the beginning, when you get yelled at and they're bullying you, uh, you know, you got to stand up, but you, you don't have the same foundation that you will four or five or six years later. And I've always told lawyers, including Yubika, who's joined us recently, that it takes, you know, a minimum of 25 to 30 jury trials and maybe about five to seven years before you really, really know how you can help a client and how you can stand up in court and do what you need to do. You've got to get those, that time in. It, you know, it's like that Malcolm Gladwell book where you've got to get, you know, the Rolling Stones were able to do concerts and the Beatles were able to do concerts in these small venues and do tons of them and really know their craft. It's the same with doing criminal law. Yeah. Well, I noticed one thing when I was a lot younger, a lot, unfortunately, a lot, lot younger. Um, but when, um, when I'd get yelled at, um, I would then, you know, I'd respond the best I could, but then I'd think later, I would drive myself nuts for like 24 hours thinking, I should have said, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, that, and I think that's part of it too, is just like, you know, we torture ourselves all the time about, you know, I, I really think that people are harder on themselves than anybody else is. Maybe it's just me. No, um, if you really care about what you're doing, like if you really care about what you're doing, then you're going to be very self-critical. And so whether you're, you know, doing a, a trial and it's a cross-examination or a jury closing or a submission to a judge, you really, over time, develop the skill to get those facts. And we've learned recently how it's so important to actually write everything out in such minute detail in order to make sure you don't miss anything. It just takes time. And then when you're younger in a practice and you're developing it, the, the, the challenge is to make sure you've got everything. Because you're going to look back, it's like when you did an exam in university, it's like, ah, oh, that question. You speak to somebody, you, you missed a point. You know, you're always going to miss something. Yeah. But as you get more um, experienced and more confident and you accept you know, what you've got to do to defend people or to litigate your case, whatever practice of area of law you're in, or frankly, if it's in other businesses, you, know, you, you develop that style of working hard to get all the details. But it's, it's, it's a grind. Well... I like to think of it as information management skills in a way. Like when I was, I was trying to help because I have this nonprofit that I do as well. So, um, you know, and, and a big part of that is trying to help people figure out how to help their lawyers as best as possible. That's all I can do through the nonprofit. <clears throat> so well, you advocate a lot. Yeah, well, that's it's, true. It's not too. just helping. You, you do a lot of advocacy work, which is yeah. really important. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I wish I had more time to, to write more and, and do more videos, but... But I'm still like doing this, sort of some of that background stuff because, as we know, like you know, if you ask somebody, can you give me your timeline or your version of events, it's just like maybe 20 pages of uh, stream of consciousness writing where you can't make any sense of it whatsoever. And you know, just like say there's like an artist who is just like, well, what do you mean you can't paint a tree? It's so simple. And he's like, you know, um, when you get really good at managing information, 
uh, sometimes it's really stunning to see how difficult it is for other people too. So I had to work with him for a while and I remember at one point it was like really late and I was exhausted and I was like, you know what? Part of, part of what I do is thinking. So I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to think about this. And then we went back the next day and it was, it was a lot easier, but. You know, you'll wake up at night and you'll come up with an answer to a, a question you had in your head about how to present an issue or an argument or how to ask certain questions. And it just goes around in your head and you, 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 you don't let go of it. And then you figure it out in the most oddest ways when you're sleeping or during a moment where you're relaxed and, and completely dis connected from what you're you're really working on and then you develop the answer to it but but to go back for a second you know we can't lose sight of the fact that the people that you help and 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 you help now as part of this firm but the psychology and the emotional impact when somebody is facing something uh, so serious as a a charge you know or if they're in family court or whatever the emotional and psychological uh, factors that are at play really inhibit people from time being able to put together their information in a coherent fashion, explain it to you, and they just want to just tell you. And it's really hard to get them organized, and we have to try and do that. So we play therapist, we play information management, we play lawyer, you play advocate as well, and I play advocate. It's, 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 a, it's an involved process. Well, and there's certain phrases which, you know, it sounds like just a regular word that, like, if you were talking outside a lot, it <clears throat> doesn't make sense to them because you're saying, well, that's not relevant. Right. And so I think, well, it is relevant because you have to understand who she is. And it's like, well, no, it won't have relevance in court. Right. Like so. Um, so I've had a number of people. And my main goal there is with with Lighthouse nonprofit is to try and in, improve the communication between a person and their own lawyer. So that when the lawyer says something to them, sometimes they'll call me freaking out. And I'm just like, no, 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 he didn't say that. That's not what that means. You're interpreting what the lawyer. Yeah, said. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, then I have to explain, you know, what relevance means to the best of my ability. But then, of course, like, you know, the law of evidence is a massive book that yeah. I own, but I haven't finished reading. That's not the only book. <laughs> I know. They keep piling It's evolving. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, too, is that, you know, the law does evolve. And that's like a big part, you know, doing legal research. It's in a way, it's almost been shocking for the last year or so, following cases, checking the new lo the new decisions every single day, seeing how fast it actually does evolve. And then the reality is, is like as busy as you get when you're a lawyer and you're actually handling like, you know, dozens of cases and stuff, yeah. how do you also have the time to keep up on the most recent decisions, you know? Yeah. So we had that issue we were talking about earlier. It's when you're involved in a certain type of case and you're running, you know, in that instance we were talking about a constitutional challenge of, of something, a mandatory yeah, minimum, minimums. and you're totally in that zone, right? You've got all the information, you've got all the cases, you've got everything, <clears throat> and then you're out of that for you know some period of time doing other work, and then you have to come back to that on another case. It's You, you have to get up to speed quick because sometimes things are changing rather quickly, and we know in this business now mandatory minimums are falling fairly quickly now in various areas that we deal with. But you've got to be able to collate that information and assimilate it really quickly so that you can help the client and, and do what you need to do. But you, you, it's like it, you've got to have a system in place. And it's, it's, it's a big transition when you come into this aspect of it because you're, you're adept at doing research and you love doing it. I'm but fast. it's like, really yeah, but it's like it's, it can be very transitional over the course of even a year as to where you go from one point in law to another point. And so you've got to be able to just get it. Try and understand it, understand what's behind it, and pull in other, other factors and other cases to help support your points when you're making arguments. Well, here's an issue that I think is hard for people to understand too: is like when you know if a law is passed and it's unconstitutional, why does it take seven, sometimes you know some current issues, ten years, for it to actually get challenged? And one of the things is, well, how do you get standing to challenge something, right? Yeah, so there's a law that comes into place and, and, and you know, you, you don't like it. So as an advocate or as a defense lawyer who, who's also an advocate, and you, you go, this is wrong. So you speak out about it, you write about it, but you may not have a case on, on point. You may search to be an intervener to try and help on a case that's ongoing. But it takes time to get the right case with the right facts to challenge the law. 
And then you have to go at first instance, and then there's an appeal, and another appeal, and then to the Supreme Court of Canada. It just takes time. And it and can money. be... Yeah, it takes money. Like, it's a lot of work, and you have to have the clients who can fund it or some sort of fundraising for it or some support through an organization. It's, 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 not, it's not that easy to challenge these laws. That's, that's why I find when governments move... I'm sorry to say this precipitously. I don't want to beat this drum too much, but when they move precipitously because they don't like a particular case, they don't like a particular outcome, and they do something stupid, and they create new law through their legislation, and you need to challenge it, that can cause so much damage for a number of years until it gets corrected. It's, I know. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy because they don't then go back. If it's finally found to be unconstitutional, they don't go back and correct all of the people who've been convicted under the unconstitutional law in the past. Well, I mean, you know, th you can go back, but, you know, you can't undo so much damage. It may not be applied retrospectively. And you can imagine, like, if you think, you know, if the Supreme Court of Canada would have declared that the new legislation regarding preemptory challenges was unconstitutional, all those murder cases that went on during the period where you couldn't do that, those would all have to be retried. Right, which would be a nightmare. Right, so you know, who knows what factor that played with the Supreme Court of Canada. Like, it's just, you know, it's mind-boggling in that respect. And it's... When you say, though, getting the right case with the right facts, that's one of the things that I'm kind of seeing now is that if you were to make a constitutional challenge on a case that's really weak, so it's not, you know, the, you know, it's not a case where you kind of look and go, this is an injustice that's really clear, right? But it's an opportunity just because you have standing. If you make that challenge, you might lose if it's not a good case to make the challenge on, and then it could make things harder. Later yeah, on. so you can challenge, you know, certain legislation based on hypotheticals, you know, reasonable hypotheticals, where you can imagine that in that hypothetical, the law would be applied in an unconstitutional way. That said, let's be realistic. It's good to come to the court with really good facts in your case. So there are sometimes cases that w will come into your lap where you've got really good facts. And, and the law, in comparison to those facts, when you do the, the, the review, it really is glaring that it's wrong. It's morally wrong. It's legally wrong. It's just, it's just wrong. Those are the ones where you really get the strongest uh, approach and the strongest application to a court to deal with that type of unconstitutionality. So you can always do the hypothetical, but you, know, you may end up with a result you don't like, and you may get, you may get the declaration, and, and it has happened. But it's great when you get that, that, that core, that foundational set of facts just speaks about cruel and unusual punishment or something that is just morally wrong. When you have that, it's great. Well, I remember not too long ago, just a few months ago, definitely within the last year, Chris in, in your firm had a case that it had been put forward as a hypothetical on a previous challenge. And they said, we're not concerned about that hypothetical because it would never happen. This is a case where a guy's wife... Um, he gave his wife a massage and then ended up losing his license. Oh my God, I remember that. That's horrible. Yeah, and College this was literally, therapist. he actually had the case where it was literally put forward as a hypothetical and they rejected it saying that's absurd. Nobody would ever try to apply it that way. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, where it comes to regulatory law, the extension of that type of uh, maxim is different than other areas, but, you know, it's absurd. It, you know, that was a really absurd situation, but... You know, that's what goes on. But you need, you need cases with really good facts, I think, um, to address these type of, you know, inequities in the law. But, yeah, that's part of the business. I know. Well, I mean, it's kind of... It's, the, the interesting thing I find from where I started and, and where I am now is, like, it's almost like getting involved in researching law is like going down a rabbit hole. And, and every single case that I look at sites like you know 10 to 20 other cases and then if you want to find out why they're citing those ones then you're going down another rabbit hole and just kind of like this conversation can go down a rabbit hole and all this other stuff then when you pull back again and you look and just be like so why do people walk into a courtroom like i described at the beginning and they're just like going i'm so afraid like i remember <laughs> and the little things are the things they're focused on um 
I remember my cell phone going off one time because even though I had it on silent, um, somehow or another, the alarm got set so it overrides your silent mode. And the alarm went off on my phone while I was in the court. I know this seems like a jump, but I'm going to tie it all together <laughs> in, in topic. So my, my, and I'm like going, oh my God, it's mine, it's mine. I'm looking for it. And I pull it out and then, and, and I couldn't get it to turn on. And then right as it turned on, if you know, if you turn sideways, it goes sideways. Mm -hmm. So then I tried to stop it and I couldn't get it. And the judge, you know, for all this, like talk about, you know, it can be intimidating and how they used to yell at people and stuff in the past. She actually looked very amused <laughs> the whole time. Yeah, well, it depends on your judge. Some will be amused, some will want your phone. You know, they're like, give me that phone. I know, it could have gone either way. But, um, but yeah, I think, like, you know, the more time you spend there, the more you, like, what, you can kind of get over stuff that happens. And We and... can't lose sight of the humanity of the process. So, like, what's important is that we're dealing with human beings. And we need the humanity always injected into the process. That's really important. Mm -hmm. And, you know... That brings me back to like, you know, if you, if you think about, you know, I don't watch at all crime dramas or any of that stuff. I watch apocalyptic movies. If it's got a zombie, I don't care how bad of a movie it is. I love it. And that gives me total perspective on my life, right? Not because there's zombies in my life, but I just love not doing anything related to my work when I'm, I'm, I'm off. But, but I love vampires. I love vampires. I can deal with vampires. It's pretty good. But I like <laughs> vampires and lichens too. Like those are the, aren't those the werewolves? Anyways, oh, um, they are. Yeah. Um, but you know, so we were talking about this earlier. There's this show called The Practice. So when I was a young lawyer in 1997, 1998, I watched it, and you know, Bobby Donald, uh, what's his name, Dylan Mc, uh, McCormick or whatever his name was. So he's okay. giving jury addresses and stuff. And you know what I found interesting about it was because I saw really great criminal defense lawyers here, um, you know, doing uh, and giving really great jury addresses. Uh, but what resonated with me was the fact that you always wanted to personalize your client. You did everything you could during the course of the trial in front of a jury um, through examination or cross-examination. They're just not stopping to call me. Hold on one sec. John, I'm just doing a podcast right now. Can I call you back? Oh, yeah. You want to say hi? Just say hi to everybody. Say hi. Hi. Hi, John. Hi, John. We'll call you back, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, bye. Um, but like, the, you know, how you, how you make your client known, how you personalize them, how you make them familiar. That was something that, that was interesting about it. But. Well, and for the people who aren't used to being in court too, we're sitting there. I can guarantee you that if you're not on the other side of the bar where you get that nice little glass of water, the moment you walk into a courtroom and set your stuff down and then, you know, you have to stand up and the judge is entered and, and you have to be really quiet. Yeah, God forbid you have a bottle of water. We're not allowed to bring in a bottle of water or anything. Like Okay, but i got to tell you a secret. So you'll see when you're at council table the type of cups you have. So pre-pandemic, there's two types of cups. There's the clear plastic and the styrofoam. You want to be in a courtroom that has styrofoam. Yeah. Why? I have no idea. Not because I'm going to bring in Collingwood whiskey. <laughs> but because I'm going to come in with my Tim Hortons coffee, which is better now because it's dark roast and it's much better, and you pour it into the cup, the styrofoam cup. Oh, and they you, can't see and what you you're convince, drinking. And you convince the court clerk it's or the register water. not to rat you out so you can have coffee while you're there so nobody can see what the liquid is inside. But when they've got those clear plastic ones, man, you're stuck with water. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's like you got your client, you're trying to personalize them. And, um, and you need coffee. And, yeah, they need coffee, especially if they've had to fly because they're coming in from out of town and all this other stuff. But um, but they're super stressed out. They're in this bizarre environment, which is the same to them as what I was describing, having gone through as well. And and then, you know, you, your throat instantly dries out the moment the judge walks into the room and you're just like, you know, so, but they have to, they're being watched all the time. And that's the other thing, too. Have you ever, I think this is more of a woman thing, actually. If you're walking and you suddenly know somebody's watching you, it's like you forget to walk. Like, I, I don't remember how to walk anymore. And you just seem like all like, like you're on stilts or something like that. I think yeah, that wears off. I th well, not it wears off for you, but like your clients have never been accused quite often, have never been accused before. 
Yeah, but no that's why it, it was so important pre-pandemic when we had trials, not on Zoom, you know, where you would, like, it, it was a must for our clients to book a time to have somebody from the firm take them to court and watch trials so that they got the feeling of what it was to where the judge sits, where the witness sits, where the court reporter is and the clerk and just get the idea. So it's no longer a mystery. It's demystified. They understand what goes on in the courtroom. So it's much easier to be at ease because when you go in having no experience, if you don't do that at all, it can be terrifying, yeah. right? And for somebody who's been doing this for a long time, like you walk in a courtroom like it's your bedroom, um, but less fun. And, well, <laughs> depends on, depends depends on, depends on your spouse, but anyways. Um, uh, honey. Um, but, you know, you you got to get them acclimatized, acclimated to that environment. It's really important. And there's small things, too, that I think people forget to mention. And, and there's things that we don't know, too. So, um, you know, they're going, okay, this is it. I've been waiting quite often for, like, a year and a half, two years oh, to, yeah, to yeah, get yeah. to trial. And they're like, okay, this is it. And then they're freaked out because they're like, I could go to jail, right? And it's important to remember, you could. Like, you, you can't guarantee an outcome, so you could go to jail. Yeah. And then they, they don't necessarily <clears throat> know that... They could fin we can finish trial and then not know the verdict for a while. Yeah, you know, so it's amazing how you still prepare people for that, it, you know, that that can happen. And then, what? They're not going to make a decision right now? And it's, it's like, no, they have to take the time. The judge needs to sort through the evidence. They need to write it out. And it's going to take time. And I know it's excruciating for clients. Yeah. It's, I, I can only imagine. Well, it helps if they know first. If they're well, we tell them, we, you know, we're up front, we, we tell them the process, but you know, I, I can't speak for everybody, but well, I assume my nonprofit, I get calls from like everywhere across Canada, United States, and like so lots of people I don't even know who their lawyers are, but yeah, look, you know, we're we're lucky. I, I, I've said this before that you know, I can't speak about the country, but uh, you know, I, I've done work in Montreal, in Toronto, we have a really great number of outstanding criminal lawyers in our city, um, uh, but leaving that aside, and I know how great we are, but leaving that aside, you know, you've got to prepare the people for the, for the emotion and the psychology and the process. But even when you do, they forget, mm -hmm. right? Why? Because they're terrified. It's a difficult, scary process. For anybody who's, who's really just, you know, an emotional being, it's got to be terrifying. And... Yeah. And, and even at the end, you might forget everything that your lawyer told you. I mean, imagine when people testify and, you know, you've, you've helped them try and understand the process of examination and cross-examination, and still it's a mystery to them once they hit the stand. Well, what's a, what's a really fun one that's, that's common? Like, I love playing prosecutor, actually. I, I've noticed. <laughs> you can draft out cross-examination. I'm a really nasty I wonder what that comes from. Is there, prosecutor. Is, there some, is there some desire to be a prosecutor in there, deep in there? There was an internet, because I used to go on forums on the internet, there was, there was a game um, called Justify Anything. And uh, so somebody would say something, and then you had to find a way to justify it or whatever. I love being able to switch and try to, like, you know, take on any perspective. And, and I think because, you know, I've done a lot of writing in my past, and so when you write, you have to become different characters all the right. time. Yeah, that's that's closer actually to the. Yeah, I did like that game though, Justify Anything. <laughs> but you got it here when you want to cross examine her clients. I did like that, but it, it's more like, um, yeah, you know, my my background with film and you know, you know, creative writing. Since I was like fourteen years old, I was writing stuff. People told me I should get published, and and uh, a part of being, and I was really good at dialogue, but. Um, but actually, like becoming when when I was writing, I I actually become another person. I started to to think like there was more than I used to walk down the street on, on my way home from school in elementary, you know, yeah, elementary school, and catch myself talking out loud because I'd be thinking this thing happened at school and I could have handled that better, and so I'd replay the whole conversation yeah, yeah. for myself and yeah, I'd yeah. be each person going back and forth. But that's um, analytical. But I particularly like playing the devil, the prosecutor, yes. Well, you've do. done it very well with a number of our clients. But the interesting thing that happens when we do that is, you know, one of the things we I win. try to do... <laughs> we win. One of the things I try to do is I, I try you to prove present... prove their innocence. 
I try to present every type of question. And what do we often hear? Is that a question? Right? So the format when you're doing, so there's a difference if it's your witness and you're in chief, you have to ask open-ended questions. And if you're uh, cross-examining, then you can, you ask um, leading leading questions, but they have to be phrased in certain ways. Right? So I, I try to give them all the different things and, and then they drop the formality. So the, the normal thing is I'm going to suggest to you that this thing actually is what happened instead of what you, whatever you've said. Right. Yeah. But it gets more brutal than that. Right. Like we've seen it and you know, sometimes they don't even ask the right question. Um, but you know, we try and train them. So you, you've seen me cross examine. So although I may, Say at Happily. times, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I, I may say at times, you know, I suggest to you, but other times I may be very to the point and aggressive. It depends on the context, right? Right. But, You'll get a feel. You know what's so great about this work is when you're cross-examining, and I can't say this for crown attorneys because I'm not sure how 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 they feel because I've never been a prosecutor and I never will be. But um, when you're cross-examining, you know, you get a a feel for the person you're cross-examining and you get an understanding of their psychology after a while and then you can go at them in different ways and so you're going to you're going to use different phraseology and ways of presenting questions to them which you know can evoke answers and and responses that you need for your case but for our clients um it can be challenging because the way Prosecutors may approach them, maybe more pedantic, um, uh, but uh, problematic for them. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but like, well, so there's a few things actually that you know we end up having to explain to them. So, <clears throat> what's uh, this? You can ask leading questions versus you have to ask open questions. So explain the principles behind that. So. Um, when you're calling your own witness, so if I'm calling my own client to testify, I'm not allowed to lead them because I'd be suggesting the answer. You know, so let's imagine. Let's so it's imagine. you testifying instead of them. Yeah, it's me right? testifying. So let's imagine. So um, did you did not um, pull the trigger? No, uh, accidentally. What happened was that the rock fell and it hit the butt of the gun, and the trigger accidentally uh, went off. Is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. It was a total accident, Mr. Newberger. That's absolutely right. So you can't suggest the answers. Say yes or no yeah, I mean, no. you can't you can't suggest answers, and and th- these are basic tenets of our law system. So when you're calling a witness, you can't do that. But when you're cross examining your opposing witness, you can suggest uh, alternative possibilities and suggest answers Why? to them, because that is the way you get to the truth, and I firmly believe that cross examination is the crucible of finding the truth in any trial. And you got to know what the fuck you're doing when you're yeah. cross-examining. Because if you don't reason. know how to ask a question or why to ask a question, or better yet, when not to ask a question, then you're in trouble. There's another reason, though. It has a name. Brown and Dunn. Yeah, you have to, you have to put your case... Thank you very much. You have... Do you like it? I can taste the toasted and the maple. I, I have to say... Both of them. This Collingwood... <laughs> blended Canadian whiskey, toasted maple, stay finished is really quite we're, good. We're not even getting paid to do this. <laughs> no, but I actually like it. So leave that aside. But you know, you have to um, you have to put your case to the to the witness. So you got to put your defense to them. So if you're going to say it didn't happen, you got to put that to them because it's only fair. If you don't do it, then you're going to get blamed for not giving them the opportunity to explain. So if you say you're lying about uh, being slapped or you're lying about a fraud, you've got to put that to them. You, they have to have the right of the opportunity to answer that question. I it's will let fair. you know, I will let you know, sir, that I know a lawyer down in L.A. who told us that Canadians are full of shit because we have that rule. He thinks it's absurd. He, he said it's, there's nothing like it in the States. I don't know if he's doing it. I, know, I don't know the U.S. law. But he actually thought the Brown and Dunn rule that you had, that you couldn't like surprise people at the end was a, a horrible. You know, so that's thing. interesting. So I, I have experience with criminal law in the United States, and uh, I've watched trials and I've been part of some trials. 
And um, if you're a really good cross-examiner, the reason you put your case to a witness is not so much because you want to be fair to them to allow them to answer the questions, but you need the trier of fact, the jury or the judge, to understand your case before your client hits the stand. Or if you're just relying on cross-examination, whoever is trying the case, a jury or a judge, has to understand where you're coming from. If you don't do that, they'll never understand it. And so a seasoned, intelligent, capable cross-examiner will know how to do that. If they don't do that, then in my opinion, you're not really doing your job and you're not doing uh, justice to cross-examination. And I, and I learned from, you know, I, I said it. You wrote a book on it, didn't you? I, I wrote a small thing, but, you know, oh, I, I learned okay. from, you know, I watched Earl Levy, John Rosen, uh, you know, Jack Minkowski, who recently passed away, sadly. I watched these icons of criminal law cross-examine when I was a student and a young lawyer, and I went and watched, and I sat with them, and I had the privilege of doing that, and I learned how they did it. And you understand the ethos, the, 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 the logic, the intelligence of that, and then you develop your own style of how you go about it, but you have to do it. You've got to, you know, when I, I learned how to do a jury trial, it was very easy. They're bored from the get-go, yeah. right? They're bored. So they're just normal 12 people, and they're like, you know, what the fuck am I doing here? Okay, I'm doing my civic duty. And they hear some witness testify or some complainant testify, and then the Crown asks a bunch of questions, and they may do a very good job of being emotive and getting them to cry and saying, how'd you feel at that moment, and bullshit like that. And, and then you get to cross-examine. And if you're deadpan and not evoking emotion, you're dead. You're going to lose. But if you, if you entertain... <laughs> If you, and I don't want to say well, that. Well, yeah, I, 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 I gotta know. be careful. It's not just about entertaining, but there has to be some drama to it, and well, it, and there has to be some because there's drama to life, and you have to actually get a sense. That Every you know case somebody. is a drama. Every case is a drama. There's a story to be told. Tell I feel the story. Like, I I feel like every case they help with. It's a movie I watched, and it's that's... a it's a story to be told, and when you're cross examining. You're telling a story through cross-examination of what your client's defense is. And you're doing it in a way where you have to be really good at your craft so they get interested, or a judge, and they understand where you're going. You do it with pictures. You do it with messages. You do it with uh, a certain Show phraseology. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's what makes it so much fun. Cross-examination, there's the two best things about this business. Cross-examination and closing arguments, particularly in front of juries. And it's your ability and your opportunity to really embrace the whole situation and get across the meaning of your client, the defense, and it's just such a wonderful thing to do, and it's a privilege. And that's what makes this business, that's why I'm here 20, 29 years. Well, I mean, to say it's like watching a movie, I, I, I don't want to take away from the significance that these are real people's lives, you know, because oh, yeah. that's the thing that obviously becomes clear and, and, and makes our, our job actually more valuable is, the, you know, the number of people who are just like, their lives depend on us and they're so thankful when you, when you actually listen and, and, and represent them in a meaningful way. But, um, but that's the thing that makes good movies great is that it's about real people that other people can relate to. And so right. that's the thing that you have to find when you're looking at these cases is just like, why does this particular complainant not ring true? There's something about it, but then figuring it out, shaking, shaking out all the, the details and figuring out why they're not believable when it's false and why the, you know, why the other person is believable or coming to some sort of a mutual agreement on what actually did happen based on real people's ability to connect. I mean, great movies are great because it's a an experience that people can relate to. And, and that's, and I think, emotive. why you like... And I haven't been there, but you've been in jury trials, and I think that's why you like juries. It's like real people have to relate to it. I used to like jury trials. When we were allowed to have them. When I was allowed to have peremptory challenges. I mean, I, I, I love jury trials because it's people from our community that you can relate to, who can relate to your client and, and, and the witnesses for the Crown. Um, and you get an opportunity to 
um, evoke their experiences and their emotions and get them to understand the humanity and dynamics of a case. It's, it's really wonderful. It's creative. It's uh, intellectual. It's a lot of fun. Um, I don't know anymore if it's going to be that much fun when we don't get a chance to have a meaningful uh, opportunity to select a jury. And it's not because we don't think people are... Not, not every person who comes up to be a juror wants to be there. And they may have biases or issues. And that's out the window unless you bring a challenge for cause, which I can explain later on. But it's much harder in Canada to do that. So, But I think jury trials are, are, are a wonderful exercise of democracy. You know, you've got... 12 people from the community judging people and it, it's this is this is a core element of our democracy and it's a great opportunity and it's um it it's it, it's not where um judges are are trained and and read law and they were lawyers before and they're listening to all the political stuff that goes on and 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 studies and shit that there's being thrown at them and a jury is just 12 people from the community who are like, okay, I'm fucking here. I'm going to hear this case. I'm interested. And then they drill down. And they become they judges. They haven't found a way to get out of jury duty. No, but when you <laughs> get that right set of 12 people, they really take it seriously. And they really drill down. And they want to figure it out. And they want to do the right thing. I believe that firmly. And that's democracy. And it's a wonderful exercise of our, our system, and I think it's great, uh, and I'm sorry that it's being eroded, and that, that, that hurts me as a, as a litigator. And that's why I'm biting my tongues. I'm just like, if you find 12 people who can't figure out how to get out of jury duty, do you really trust them to be intelligent? I, 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 I've had the, I, I'll be honest, look, I, I can be cynical about this, but I've had the privilege of doing well over 100 jury trials, and maybe only about a handful of cases, I felt that they weren't engaged as they should be. Now, of course, my record of winning in juries are really good, but leaving that aside, I really did get the feeling that they got it. And it, when you run the case properly, you develop a, you know, both the Crown and the defense can develop a relationship with the jury, not by talking to them directly, but by getting them to understand the evidence. It's an incredible dynamic. I, I it's, it's such an organic process. I, I don't know what to say. It's 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 wonderful when it's when it really works. You sound like Pollyanna. Huh? No, I remember I remember us being on a panel discussion before, and I and I said something. You gave me this dirty look because um, I was being really cynical about my faith in the public, and and that's in part because I. <clears throat> was doing advocacy, spending a lot of time on social media, and that can depress the fuck out of you. Right. <laughs> so, so I was questioning my faith in in juries uh, during a, a, a specific panel yeah, discussion yeah. we did, and and yeah, you kind of tossed me a dirty look because you like juries, right? I do. And you, so I like people. So I'm gonna get a little bit meta here because, you know. I actually consider myself um, to be quite positive um, in, in terms of my faith in the public in a political sense, in that I think that socialists um, don't believe in people, so they have to legislate compassion. Mm. And yeah, the, that works. <laughs> conservative, yeah, right, it doesn't work. No. And conservatives actually foster people working together and you know, bonding as a community, getting together to solve problems, uh, because they're optimists and they believe that people can do things, right? So, so you know, I, I guess I kind of diverged a bit off on my faith in juries because I actually am an optimist. I'm a conservative. And I think that people can actually um, work together more capably and more willingly, more readily when you don't legislate compassion or set them up with a bunch of rules and, and so on. Maybe that's why I, I have some reservations about juries because juries are set up with a task and, but. And they get into so, it. They get you've into got it. experience with it. So. They get into it. And, and, and when, when, you know, when a, you've got a good, 
a good judge who gives them the instructions and emotes with them. They get into it. They understand the process. They get the the principles. And you have to relate to them. You you, you have to explain to them their role. And, and, and the judge helps with that usually. And you do that through your questioning. And then when you get those closing arguments, and I have a, I have a method that I use. And then you see that shift. You see that transition from... It's like the secret formula? No, it's like... <laughs> It, it's like it, it just you have to just appeal to their understanding of what is so important about what they're doing. And you you see that transition in them where they go from just like somebody who's like, oh, fuck, I want to get out of here to like, tell me more. You know, they want to hear it. They absorb it like a sponge. I've seen that happen a lot of times. And it's wonderful. And And my fear in this country is that we're eroding that process the jury process and and i think it's something which is a shame because we're giving it up for efficiency uh because we're so concerned about a trial within a reasonable period of time and i and i get why that's important but shit happens like a pandemic you know people get sick um uh, you know lives are are complicated and people have schedules and so not everything's going to happen within nine months or 10 months or 18 months you know but what I think is important is getting a fair trial. Not necessarily a fast trial, but a fair trial. And that's what I'm interested in. And then sometimes I think there are certain cases that are best tried before juries. And, and I, I'm not disparaging judges. Uh, you know, By and large, I, I would say that our judiciary wants to do the right thing and cares about it. But they're bombarded with information from all sorts of sources that we may consider to be a problem, right? So I have concerns about that. But I believe deep down that the majority of our judges really want to get it right. But it's the, 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 all the other machinations that are going on that impact on them. Juries, they're immune from that. They don't go to judge school. They don't have to go into conferences, education seminars where they hear from interest groups and other people. You know, juries just some guy who came out from, is an electrician and a teacher and a professor and an accountant and a... Uh, you know what? What a doctor or what have you, and they're all sitting there haphazardly as a jury, brought together collectively for a democratic process to try a citizen uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. What a great concept! Yeah, well, you know, I, I love it, and I, I guess I I'm do. I mean, ideological about it. You, you're kind of getting me excited. Can you tell? Um, no, <laughs> I am actually excited to to participate. I'm, I'm excited, but I'm also really nervous. Um, about having a first jury trial because I've never well, you'll experienced that one. before. We got one coming up. I know, I've only well, just seen them in the movies. We need vaccinations before that one starts. But. Yeah, I know, and and, and I, I don't think we can reduce it to half the number of people just to get no. COVID. No, no, that can't happen either. And and I think it's important to remember that if if a lawyer determines that a case has to be by by jury, that oops, that you know it's going to have to be put over and adjourned so that we can get that trial. We're in an unprecedented time with a pandemic, and that's just the way it is. Um, and we can't be you know, hard and fast to the idea that it's got to happen within a specified period of time. This is insanity. We're living in a very crazy time right now. So, but, but there are certain cases that, that, that are meant to be in front of juries. And so yeah. that'll happen. I got a serious question. You know, we, we've both seen 12 Angry Men. But that was made a long time ago. Do you think it was modern? It would only be 10? Like, do you think no. metric would have changed the jury selection number? <laughs> I think 12 is important. Yeah, more than 10? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's an arbitrary number. But I think you need well, a, a representative sample. I mean, you know, populations, it, it's based on population size. So, you know... Now, given our population in Canada is 12 sufficient, maybe we should have 14 or 15. But when you get too large oh, of a group, you, can, can't, you can't get then consensus. Then you've got Twitter. Then you've got Twitter, and that yeah. is not justice. So, I, I, you know, 12, I think, is a reasonable number as a representative sample of our community, given our population size and our, device, our, our diversity issues, etc. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't want to go down to a smaller group. That bothers me. Half need, is definitely too small. Way too small. At least 12. I can tell oh, you from high school bullying 
that you can easily get six people on your side just because they're afraid of you as opposed to they agree with you. So right. I'm so very you, you, afraid you of need, six people. You need a large enough sample, like a scientific study, where you can get a reasonable answer. So there has to be validity to that answer. So I think 12 is not bad. Yeah. 14, maybe, given our sample of our population. But, I, but when you get too large, it's not going to work. Okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Or if you want to increase Can it Can we talk 12, about my favorite prelims soon? Yes. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I know which one you're talking about. But um, if you want to, your defense lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Was it just a prelim? It was just a preliminary inquiry on a, on a first-degree murder. And it had to do with scotch. But we'll, yeah. we'll talk well, about I know which one you're talking about. Um, if, you know, so you're a defense lawyer. And so if you um, want to increase the number of people, is that because you only need to get one to disagree with you? So what if do you, you have, increase your number? So if you want to say we shouldn't just have 12, maybe it should be more than that, right? I don't know so, if we advocate for that. I mean... Is it true that you only need one person to disagree? Well, you got a hung jury, but then you don't win. So if, you, if, 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 if there's a hung jury, so you have one or two or more people, we never know how many won't agree with the majority, then you've got a hung jury and you retry it. Yeah, there may be the chance that uh, a Crown will not pursue the case again. Um, but, you know, everybody needs closure. Uh, That's so. the problem with retrials for all the many reasons things get sent back to retrial, which is so unfortunate. It's yes. always unfortunate when you need a retrial. It's unfortunate to get a wrongful conviction. It's unfortunate to get, a, you know, yeah. an unsafe you know, conviction. But this, this is not this is not science, right? We have to understand that that that, that uh, you know, law, and what we talk about is criminal justice, is not a science. It's a exercise in human experience, psychology, it be a emotions. Science. Yeah, why, it's, it's why can't impossible. we make it a science, Joseph? We should be able to just you know. This is why I love the law. There's I logic you, in the law. Get, I did not get a good grade in physics. So if it was based on science, I'd be fucked. But um, I'm good in logic. But it, it, you will never. Human beings are human beings. We can't deny our nature. We will agree, disagree, abstain because of who we are. It's an exercise in emotions and 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 psychology and all sorts of combination of factors. That's why it's not a science. It, that's why. There is no definitive answer. That's why my son Jack, who is in grade nine, says to me, I love math because there's only one answer. I know. Right? Because in this other shit that we have, there's not one answer. When you're dealing with psychology or sociology or political science when you're in school, there's not one answer. There's arguments. There's arguments in criminal law. And we think there's one answer. We believe in our client's innocence because we know the truth. But it's hard to get that across to a judge or a jury. Especially, and nobody has the ability to look into somebody's mind. That's Especially that. in a world where it recently became controversial to say that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Common sense. Common sense. But common sense is being undermined. Yeah. Right yeah. now it's being disparaged. Like only in certain types of cases. But there's a... a there's a massive body of history in law to say that, you know, people need to use common sense. That's why we like juries. And when we have a judge alone trial, yeah. we say, like, you know, we, we depend on you using common sense to discern certain inferences. And You hit on a very important point, which is how, no matter how a judge instructs a human being in a jury about how they should think to assess evidence and come to a verdict. You can't escape the fact that a human being will still rely on their own concept of reality and common sense. And that's why sometimes you need a jury. Because they will think in a way different than a judge. Yeah, and that's kind of why I'm eager to engage in a jury trial because I've been tracking this undermining of common sense that's been going on in the courts where you're saying, you know, um, myths and stereotypes and 
Um, you know, we don't, we don't know when you say, well, common sense tells me. Common sense is, is actually always been a core principle of the law. And people, okay, I, I'm going to figure out how to phrase this better. I think that there's probably at least, you know, 10 people I know who would make a better prime minister than Justin Trudeau, right? Just it's, 10? Just, you know, I'm just thinking, I could keep going, but I've only I, got In this two room, minutes, all of us would right? be a better prime okay. minister. And, and any politician who's running is like, I know somebody would make a better person than that. And uh, common sense and I'm tells me... I'm sorry to anybody who watches this and is a liberal, but anyways. Common sense tells me that um, the people that we're electing aren't accurately representing us. And, um, who wants to run for this? We're in a whole different realm. But if you I, want to run know, for politics, it's, it's you've got to subject yourself to a thing. microscope and, and a whole different... Look, I don't envy politicians. And, you know, I have... Look, you know... I respect Justin Trudeau as prime minister. I don't it's agree cute. with him. I, I don't like how things have been run. That said, you have to have a certain type of metal and a certain, a certain type of personality run from politics because your whole life is in view and the criticisms and the invasiveness is pervasive and it's very problematic. Wow. So we don't necessarily will get what we need as a government because of the whole system. I'm pretty sure Meghan Markle and, and Ugh, her let's not just go gave there. A, a yeah yeah I know it's like I can't even remember why. Let's talking. go to my topic about that preliminary inquiry on a murder. Okay, case. so so here's the thing. You know, one of the things that we were talking about um, over the last couple of days was um, how people loved real crime and all this other stuff, and they get obsessed with murder trials and all that. I've never done a murder trial. I don't know if I even like it. I'm not sure. You've done them though. But one of the funny stories you have to tell about a murder trial is... So it's a, a preliminary inquiry I had in Newmarket in 2014. And it was a very interesting case. And my client was absolutely unequivocally innocent. It was a wrongful identification for reasons that had to do with respect to conflict within a community. Anyways, it was a, a, a preliminary inquiry that lasted about four weeks where there were 17 eyewitnesses against my client. The, at the end of the prelim, the Crown uh, agreed to a discharge of my client, which is very good. But that was not the best part. <laughs> this was so much funny. I have the utmost of respect and, and admiration for the Crown attorneys in that case. And the first witness that they called, it was hilarious. First witness, and the judge, I... This judge is a great judge and is, is, is still practicing as a judge in, in Toronto. But the first witness testifies that he went into my client's restaurant and he sat at a table and the Crown asked, so what did you do next? I ordered a scotch. And the Crown, who has an immense sense of humor, said, well, what scotch did you order? And he said, Johnny Walker. And I'm at my defense table and I turn to John, who called me a little while ago, and I go, Quietly, I said, that's not a real scotch. The crown said, Your Honor, just an indulgence for a moment. And he walked over and leaned over to me. It's a blended scotch, Mr. Newberger. <laughs> and then for the next three weeks, I got emails from that crown attorney about the history of John Walker. And it was, it was great. And we, we litigated the case. Which, our first case together at trial, you were drinking Johnny Walker. That's right. And I think he turned me. But like, but but you know what's so wonderful about this story? It was a serious situation. Yeah, it was a but murder fact, trial. But the fact that the Crown and I and all of us could relate in a human way and still maintain perspective but do our jobs is wonderful. And at the end of the day, these two Crown attorneys were stellar and they saw what the truth was and they did the right thing. Mm. But they maintained a sense of poise and humor and humility and intelligence that made this process enjoyable for us. You know, I, I, I don't want to take away from the horrific nature of that somebody was dead and my client yeah. was charged, but my client was innocent, absolutely factually innocent. Yeah. But 
in order to do our jobs correctly, we can't be assholes. We can't be tunnel vision. Because if we are, we're going to miss the truth. I know. Well, And that story about how he leaned over and said, it's a blended scotch, Mr. Newberger. It was just fucking hilarious. It floored me. And we were able to relate, relate on a level that I didn't think we would be able to relate. And that was great. We had an open dialogue. As the witnesses came up, as he examined, as I cross-examined, we had an open dialogue. That was a wonderful exercise in the process. That's how it should be. Well, One of my best experiences in my career. Yeah, I mean- I think, actually, in my very limited career compared to yours, I've been rather blessed. Um, So one thing that happened is that a person I was helping, the prosecutor recommended acquittal at the end of the trial. And uh, so we presented evidence um, to undermine, you know, he he did testify, which you ought to be prepared for every time you're accused of domestic violence or sexual assault. Um, but in this case, Even the prosecutor murder. actually, yeah, uh, prosecutor rem- recommended acquittal. That was a unique and, and amazing experience because I don't know if it's even on the record if, you, if I was to order the transcript, but um, the prosecutor recommended acquittal and um, the judge had been, because the complainant spoke really fast, had been making crazy notes the entire time through. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, mm, 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 trying to keep up. And I was like, and how many baths do you own? All the, like, yeah, you know, yeah. crazy shit, right? And then he's just like, and then she recommends the acquittal and he just dropped his notes like this. And he goes like, well, <laughs> I was ready to go back there and make a decision. And I can tell you, I probably would have come to the same conclusion that you did. <laughs> but I don't know. And so... Thank you. I want to appreciate that you actually, you know, took the, there's a duty of the prosecutor to, to yeah. seek the truth. So he goes like, so this is resolved. But since we have a bit of time in our hands, do you mind if I say something? And we're all just like, no, Your Honor, go ahead. Please tell us what's on your mind. And he said, I don't think I've ever told you this story before. Mm. He said, I'm here and I don't know him. I don't know her. And I have very little time to figure it out. Yeah, right. I could have decided, you know, that he was guilty. I could have decided he wasn't. I didn't know anything. And I admire the prosecutor and thank that prosecutor for admitting that their case wasn't proven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you'd left it to me, it could have gone either way. And he expressed, and this is why I'd like to order the transcript if I can get it, he expressed his frustration at the fact that he has to determine the outcome of an actual person's life. Yeah. When he's in a, a, a minute, limited circumstance of what's evidentially you know, admissible and all this other stuff, and he has to determine the fate of this guy. And we came up with an email. It was actually one particular really right. Love that skunk. When can we, can, when can we get a pet skunk and move in together? Uh, email from this person where the prosecutor goes, can you give me that? Yeah, here it is. It's yours. And she conceded that it was lost. That he made an incredible speech about how easily this guy could have been convicted. Yeah, so this goes back to why I say that I believe our judiciary um, really wants to get it right. But we, we can't lose sight of the fact of the reality of our system. And I say this in submissions, and I say this in closing arguments to jury. What do we really know about these people? We know a snippet of their lives. We know a snippet of an interaction between this state and this state. That's all we know. And you get to observe them, and you get to hear the examination, the cross-examination. That's exciting. But what do we know about these people? And based upon this limited amount of evidence... You make monumental decisions about their lives. That's what's brought to bear in these cases. And that's why sometimes I believe juries are incredibly important. Because judges are under a lot of pressure. And they have other factors playing around in their head. And I'm not going to go into it right now, but we know what we're talking about. The politics behind all this. Juries, which I think we should place more faith in, and we should endorse more, 
rather than what we're doing in Canada. They're just people. They have smell. They have common sense. I think I agree with you. I just... Um... No, but, but what's important is when I say to a jury, what do you know, really, about mm. this person and You're that person? You're convincing me right now. What do you really know that's about them? <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's my style. But, but what do you really know about how people really react, how they really behave, how they really feel, what their motivations are, why they want to do this, why they make bullshit up, why he may be lying, may she be lying, or whoever the fuck it is. That's why juries are so important. Because guess what? They've experienced this shit. I know. I, I, Judges I, I live in an artificial that. world, and your judge in that case, whoever that person is, expressed the frustration with not being able to relate to that. They're confined I'm with information. I'm going to get the transcript because I think it's No, really but that's important. a perfect example of why I, I think But I don't want to name great. him. Even if I remembered his name, I wouldn't name him. We don't want to Because he's saying, he's saying what a lot of other he judges needs are an, thinking. He or she needs anonymity he. with respect to it. <laughs> but but, Who but knows they're expressing, what the pronouns are They're anymore. expressing something now that, that it's an important element. It's like, what do we fucking know? That's why juries are important, in my opinion. I love juries. I think they're a great... Okay, we'll, we'll fix the table. But I, I think they're a wonderful <laughs> um, um, barometer of common sense and of experience in society and human nature and how we uh, evolve and what the fuck happens in life. And I think it's really important. And we're eroding that for artificial analysis. And that really disturbs me in the well, long run. I think it's really important because judges are so... Um, there's only some, they can't speak for themselves in public anymore. Nor should they. Nor should they. No, I don't um, think they do because they that deserve undermines independence. them and they put themselves at risk. But there's an undermining of judicial independence right now by advocates who want to re-educate them on things. And yeah. So what are they going to do about that? Because they can't say anything publicly. So who's going to advocate for them? Well, I mean, I think, you know, if I was a judge, I just would listen Could and then be. make my own. I don't want to be. But they would, thank you, but they would make their own decision. Well, not what I said about Justin Trudeau, but anyways, um, you know, I, I would listen to all arguments, but I would rely on my own common sense and knowledge and experience and no, knowledge of the law and stereotypes and all that other stuff and make the rightful decision. But, but, but judges are human beings with a lot of pressure, lots of cases. You know, it's not an easy job. It's a very difficult job. Yeah. And that's why I think they need a relief valve. Yeah. It's called a jury. And I think in this country, we're doing our best to eliminate juries. This is why you're And that so bothers good. me. As, okay. as we rely on Collingwood, toasted maplewood, oh, stave finished scotch so, to help us get through this. Let's, let's just, I'm going to give you an example of something that I know to be true. That uh, that I think that juries lack the, the the proper information to come to the proper conclusion on. Why? Why do normal human beings lack information? Why? Because if somebody, you know, this is I'm, I'm just going with Monty Python. If somebody weighs the same as a witch, uh, no, sorry, if if a witch weighs the same as a duck, if if a person weighs the same as a duck, they're a witch. Do you remember that? Not at the moment. No? Okay, so there's a but logic I love Monty principle. Python. There's a logic principle. How do we know if somebody's a witch? And uh, they burn. What else burns? Um, wood. Wood floats. Right, but what what's the floats? information it's you provide? What, but what, those people, what, I'm just what, saying, what information I'm just were they provided? That I'm just saying to you to be controversial for a moment because <laughs> I, I think we have to end this night. <laughs> I'm just saying to you that <laughs> that I don't know why Monty Python is wrong, and maybe I phrased it wrong at the beginning, but I'm I'm just telling you that when they put that woman on the scale, she weighed the same as a duck. And how do you defeat that fact, Mr. Lawyer? Common sense. Really? There's no you appeal to the collective experience and knowledge of twelve ordinary people from our community 
about how people behave. I think that works. Now, we've experienced weird shit during this pandemic. I get that. I know. Some people weigh the same as a duck. It's not their fault. I wish I did. <laughs> it's I, not I, their I fault. Don't. The pandemic maybe weighed much more than a duck. But leaving that aside, I really do believe that, you know, we can't lose sight of the importance of having members of our community try people. And With because scales where you can put a duck on one side. No, <laughs> I'm telling you, like, you know, I love our judges. I really do, by and large. I really do. But I just believe in a democratic process. That's my hang up. And I've had nothing but great experience in front of juries. Because when it came down to it, they really wanted to get it right. They wanted to understand. Okay, and, but you know, but I have concerns and, and just to go back to why like I was a little bit disagreeing with you before on my faith in the public i i led into this whole is the witch the same as the duck monty python thing it was a, a really poor setup but that's the thing is like i really wonder most people aren't really good at humor most people aren't good at remembering what it is they think they know uh, yeah they they have these cultural references and juries react to that well they really do i i, I to well, wrangle them in somehow yeah like, you know, you'd be even surprised. You could probably start with a juror who has some biases, but when you get to the end, if you address it properly, they're going to take it seriously. And that's why the collective is important. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a good collective, they'll keep some of the rogues honest. And I think that's really important. And, and, and I don't want to be disparaging again to judges because I believe our judiciary is the best in the world. I think our criminal justice system in Canada is a, is a beacon in the world. I really do. We will fix the, we'll table. Fix the table. But the fact that it's like this means that we are not a wealthy law firm. This well, it great. means we're in the basement. That's right. Okay? Because we are real people. Okay? That's why we have these boxes all around. Because we fucking oh, work. Oh, the gold phone. Okay. I'm still waiting Anyways, for God let me to go call back. Let me go back. on the gold phone. I believe judges really want to get it right. But they got a lot of stuff on their heads, their minds. You know what bonds us, Joseph? We're optimists. Alcohol? Well, maybe that's what makes us optimists. We're optimists <laughs> who believe that people don't need to have their compassion legislated. No, we don't. We I agree with innate. you. I believe, and I think you believe, that if we appeal to good human nature, that we can get the right result. And that's what's important. And we need to believe in that and we need to foster that. And as a country here, we need to ensure the protection of juries and a jury trial. And we need to ensure the fairness of the trial process. And we can't eliminate the common citizen from this process because that is the core of democracy, in my opinion. Cheers. Till next week. Thank you, Collingwood. Blended Canadian whiskey. Maybe you toasted might maple throw us a few finished. dollars next time because <laughs> this is not a paid advertisement. I really like this. No, it's not, but that's really no, good. No, it is. That's actually. really good whiskey. Yeah, that's why we're almost done the bottle. <laughs> we're taking an Uber home. Okay. I'm gonna walk. Can we walk, honey? Sure. Okay, perfect. All right. Cheers. Good night. Till next week. I can't wait for my first jury trial. It's going to happen soon. I know. No, if no. If we get vaccines. Maybe. If we get vaccines. When COVID's done. Yeah. Vaccines. When that thing's all vaccines. done. Vaccines. <laughs> Johnson, Johnson, ask it. Just don't get me started. Okay. Good night. <laughs>